Um, okay, so pizzas will come at uh, in five minutes time. Um, I'll be setting up outside. Uh, we'll do the first talk first before we have some pizzas. So meanwhile, you know, if you have time, you can fill up the short survey form I have prepared. Uh, Bit.ly slash rubysg13. Uh, let us have some of your feedback so we know how we can improve and integrate for 2014. So firstly, uh, we need to thank our sponsors. Um, this event, uh, this venue is plugin at 71, uh, block 71. So thank you so much to plugin for sponsoring us this uh, venue. Um, we have like around 70 uh, RSVPs today. So that's why I asked them to open up the back room as well. Um, so hopefully it will fit everyone in here. Uh, that is if everyone comes. <laughs> uh, sponsors, uh, we have to thank Engine Yard. Uh, they sponsored the pizzas today, um, so please help me finish the pizzas as usual because I don't want to waste any food. Um, so thank you, Engineer. They also have some stickers over here, so please feel free to help yourself. Uh, as usual, if you have something to share with the community, um, please let me know. Please get in touch. Uh, are you doing your startup on Rails? You know, launch site project. You have an opinion about testing, refactoring. CI whatsoever, uh, you have an awesome company culture like GitHub, you know, <laughs> please let me know so that uh, I can give you the 5, 10 or 15 minute slots. Um, you know how to reach me, um, either by Twitter or by my email account. Um, is the guy outside? Come on in. <laughs> uh, so one thing I'd like to sort of announce is we now have a website at ruby.sg. Uh, it's a community website, so I'm not only the one doing it, working on it. Uh, we have commits from Hui Ming, from Simon, um, from Wei Ming, etc. etc. And thank you so much to Tinkerbox and Tian for sponsoring the first design draft. Uh, of course, it's still up for iteration. Um, please continue to help contribute to it um, so that uh, it will become like the authoritative source to go to when people search uh, for Ruby Singapore and from there you can link it out to uh, all the other various um, web properties that we have you know, like Facebook, Google Group, GitHub, uh, etc. Alright, so please check it out. So any first timers today? Oh wow, okay. okay. So every month we have first timers. I hope you guys will continue to come um, so that you know everyone will know each other. Uh, anyone looking to hire? Really? Okay, GitHub. <laughs> so uh, at the end of the, just before we end, you know, I'll give you like two minutes to pitch about your company. So then, if anyone is interested, they can come and report you. All right. So um, today we have three talks as usual. Uh, the first will be by Michael uh, from GitHub. Uh, he'll be talking about how GitHub uses GitHub to build GitHub. Um, next, we have a remote talk. Um, it's PJ from Engine Yard, so he'll be talking about Sinatra versus Rails. Um, and finally, we have five random Ruby tips by Ying Chen, who is outside right now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's the talks that we have today. Uh, without further ado, let me hand over to uh, Michael from GitHub. Technology, yeah, it works. Hello, Singapore. Hello. So, I've uh, I've flown all the way from Adelaide, Australia, uh, to talk to you not about Ruby at all. <laughs> so instead, I'm going to talk about uh, how GitHub operates in in a workflow sense, in a culture sense, and why we operate in the way we do. Okay, so GitHub is a website, at least partly, that is built to enable the building of software, to enable collaboration, people to build software better together. So um, that's our focus on software. You can use GitHub to build other things as well, collaborate on, on other things using gists or collaborate on documents, but our focus is predominantly at the moment on software. Um, so, who has a GitHub account? <laughs> who does not? <laughs> <laughs> does, question. Does, anyone, does anyone not have a GitHub account? Seriously? 
I think this is actually the first time I've been in a room where no one's put up their hand for that. So that's that's uh, that's progress, I guess. Um, if if there was anyone who's too shy to put up their hand at this stage, then come and see me afterwards, and we'll get you set up with a GitHub account. <laughs> um, so who uses Git in their workflow? Well, <laughs> like regularly. So. Uh, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today will be Git focused. Um, so, what what do other people use regularly? Subversion, CBS, nothing, Dropbox, Dropbox. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least it's something. <laughs> All right. So, obviously, I've got a bias towards Git. Uh, I think Git is a very powerful tool for for um, supporting your software development um, and uh, the distributed nature of it is fundamental to the way that GitHub works. Uh, so use Git, it's great. Uh, so this talk, how GitHub uses GitHub to build GitHub, uh, is the, the Two Fish edition. I'm Michael C. Harris, uh, kind of what I write on official documents, but no one really knows, like Githubbers look very confused when someone says anything about Michael Harris. Um, I'm known generally as Michael Twofish. Uh, I'll answer to Twofish. Uh, and uh, the talk itself is based on talks that other hubbers have given, um, mostly stolen from um, Zach Coleman's talk that's titled how GitHub uses GitHub to build GitHub, which you might have seen. He's a much better speaker than me. Um, uh, it, it's based on uh, Tom Preston Werner's presentation on optimizing for happiness and Scott Chacon's um, GitHub flow talks. So I steal stuff. Stealing stuff is good. That's OK. Whole open source is, is built on reuse or stealing. Um, but this talk is from my point of view. Um, I've been at, at GitHub for six months, um, and uh, it's it's really about the stuff that I've gleaned in that time and the the way that my team works. So my team is the GitHub Enterprise team. Um, GitHub Enterprise is, is the same code base put on a virtual machine and installed locally in your organization. And it's basically for organizations that for some reason, usually for governance reasons, can't put their code on github.com. They, they can't put stuff outside of their, their secure network or for paranoia reasons, perhaps. Um, so they control everything about it. Same code base just distributed on a virtual machine and managed within their, their hypervisor environment. So my job at GitHub is to support that, that product. Um, and when I put my hand up saying that we're hiring, we're hiring people to do my job in the Asia Pacific region. So if support for, and support doesn't work in the same way at GitHub as it does at other companies, supports a first class team. So if you're interested in that, feel free to talk to me. Um, so especially in technology uh, organisations, we I think there's a tendency for us to focus on the technology. But it's really important that you make a conscious decision about what kind of a culture you want in your company rather than basing your culture on the technology that you're using. So um, the way that many companies grow is kind of haphazard, not really thinking about the kind of culture that they want to develop. So one of the most important things that we do at GitHub is think about the way that the culture works and what kind of a culture we want to have uh, within the company to be able to do what we do as well as we can possibly do it. So you don't want this haphazard development of your culture based around what's happening. You want to really think about the culture that you're developing. Um, one of the, 
the fundamental tenets of the culture that we want to develop at GitHub is to optimize for happiness. Now that means that, so companies can make a, a decision to optimize for profits, to optimize for money, or to optimize for the happiness of the people who are working at the company. Optimizing for other happiness as well, but for the moment we'll talk about optimizing for the happiness of the developers and the people who are working there. Now, money's great and money is definitely needed for businesses and organizations to survive and I, I want money, that's fine. I'm not saying that we don't think about money at all, but it's not the thing that the company is not going to be successful at all if we can't retain people who can passionately work on something, who are motivated to work, do their best work <coughs> on something. So we have to be really careful that we provide an environment that makes people happy in order to do their best work. Sorry. If we're thinking about optimizing for profit, then the likelihood is that people aren't going to be happy and they're going to leave and the product's going to fail anyway. So we should be thinking about the happiness of people. So people are generally motivated, according to Dan Pink, and I think he makes a good speech. You might have seen his the whiteboarding of, of this. Autonomy, mastery and purpose. Autonomy in that we want to be able to decide ourselves what's important to work on. We want to be able to think about the build better software together, in the case of GitHub, or whatever your vision is for your company, and we want to say, well, what's the thing that I can do to make the biggest impact on that, that vision? We want to be able to develop mastery in what we're doing, so we want to be able to iteratively improve, work together on, on the product to get better and better over time. And that getting better and better over time is both us personally getting better, getting better as a, as a team working together. And we want to be able to work together on a sh with shared purpose, so shared vision at GitHub. That's building better software, being, build, building tools to allow you to build better software together, to collaborate together to build software. So how do we do that? One of the things that we do is we let people, let people, it sounds like there's someone letting you, but no, that's just the, the culture that we want, is we want people to be able to do their best work and people do their best work when they work, when they want and where they want. It doesn't make any sense to say you have to work from 9am to 5pm if you're the sort of person who only really fires up at 2pm. If you're asleep for half the day, not doing your best work, then that's completely pointless. So you should be able to work whenever you feel motivated to work. If I'm motivated to do something at 6am, which is when I generally get up and start my work day, then, then that should be fine. And if the ops team finds that they work best when they go into the office at 2am, and work the whole night, then that's fine too. And it means we're distributed, um, people have their time zones overlapping. Uh, it doesn't make sense to say nine to five. And you get to choose where you work. So it doesn't make sense to say you have to come into the office and sit in your cubicle in Central and be miserable, be uh, not be able to get into a flow of work because your workmates keep talking about the cricket or <laughs> or uh, um, the phone keeps ringing or whatever. You should be, if you're the sort of person who works better at home, then you should be able to work better, do that and work at home. 
you're the sort of person who works better at a cafe in Club Street, you should be able to do that. Um, personally, I split my time between Melbourne and my wife's family's farm in South Australia, and that works well for me. That's how I am able to do my best work. So that's the culture that we want. Now, one of the things that, that <laughs> uh, thanks Winston. <laughs> uh, one of the things that that um, means is that we should be working asynchronously. And by asynchronously, I mean we don't get people together to have, you know, in the same place, both either physically or virtually, and have a conversation about how things work. We need to let people have longer evolving conversations when they're doing it when they want to work and where they want to work. So um, there's no interrupting you at your desk. There's, there's no getting you out of your flow. That conversation needs to evolve over time. Uh, the, a side effect of that is that uh, everything gets written down. So if, if the development of features is happening on issues and pull requests, then, then the thought processes are recorded. And if you have video hangouts, then we record those so that the people who aren't working at that time can catch up with them later. Now, that's not to say that the face-to-face -face time is an important time. It, it obviously is important to get together and to know people. It's important from a social point of view. Uh, but it's, it's not the normal way of developing at GitHub. Things are, by default, asynchronous. Um, and the, the synchronous stuff, the stuff where we are face-to-face, -face, is usually uh, to facilitate the asynchronous work, to make it easier for us to know each other to work asynchronously together. Okay. So, so that's a picture, a brief picture of the kind of culture that we want to build at GitHub and that we've successfully built at GitHub. But it doesn't really say much about um, how we use GitHub to build GitHub. So what do we do? Uh, Scott Chacon has uh, captured the way that we work, the workflow that we use um, in uh, what he calls the GitHub flow. And the GitHub flow is, is just a workflow of how we manage to get things from a discussion point, uh, ideas in our heads, to deployable code, to code that's out there that we can then iterate upon. It's six steps. The first step, and this is, I'll talk a little bit about Git, um, not in any depth, I'm gonna talk just very broadly about workflow stuff, but if there's stuff that, uh, that you don't understand, then feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. So, uh, the default branch in Git is usually the master branch. Uh, the way that we work, master is always deployable. We don't, we don't, uh, it's always stable. We don't develop on master. We don't push to master ever. Uh, it's always in a state that's deployable. We don't rewrite, we don't revert commits to push it back to an earlier commit or anything like that. Always deployable. Uh, the second thing is that from that stable base, when you're developing a new feature or you have a new idea or you're fixing a bug, you create a branch from master, from that stable base, that's descriptively named. So maybe I'll call my branch thumbprint authentication or uh, rockets to the moon or something. So when someone looks at the list of branches that, they, that are available, that are being worked on, they can sort of get an overview of what the whole company is working on at the same time, just by looking at the branches that are being worked on. From those 
descript those descriptively named branches, we commit locally often, and because Git is distributed, committing locally is just committing locally, so we also push those descriptive branches often. When we push those branches, continuous integration runs. So we've got a lot of tests and it's not practical to sit and wait for the whole test suite to run, which can take tens of minutes rather than minutes. Um, and we've got a very slick structure to make it as fast as that. Uh, we just push the branch, we can continue working, continuous integration is run, and, and if it fails, then we get a notification in our chat room. We know that there's something that we need to fix, but we don't worry too much about running entire test suites locally. The entire test suite is usually run remotely. So yeah, because you pushed to GitHub, your descriptive branch, when someone else fetches master fetches the remote, they'll get a list of the stuff that's being worked on. So probably the most important part of the whole process is when you want feedback, you open a pull request. Now, I think predominantly Pull requests are used. I've worked on my magnificent thumbprint feature um, so that you can authenticate to GitHub on your, your oh, this is a made up feature, this doesn't exist. Uh, so that you can authenticate to GitHub with, with your um, thumb reading phone. But I've spent the last three months doing it and I've worked tirelessly and now my pull request, uh, my feature is finished, and I open a pull re request saying, here you go, here's my finished feature. And I think that's generally what a lot of people do. And it's certainly before I joined GitHub, that's what we were doing as well. Um, that's what I was doing in my work. But that's not the way things work at GitHub. Pull requests are often opened after a, a couple of lines of code have changed. So fundamental to the way that the process works at GitHub is open pull requests early. On that pull request, you're going to talk about what, what you're doing. Are you fixing what bug you're fixing, what feature you're going to implement, why you're going to implement that feature, and how it might fit into a broader context. And we use mentions, so you can at mention a person who might be interested in the thing that you're doing, or you can at mention a team. So for instance, if I'm uh, interested in my, my thumbprint feature, how people will use that, I might say, okay, I'm interested in implementing this thing. I might have a checklist of the things that I would need to complete to do it. I might mention the GitHub UX team because it's obviously a user experience thing and I need their expertise. I might, I might uh, mention the mobile team because I need their expertise as well. <coughs> and then from there, that very early stage in the development, there's a dis an asynchronous discussion that develops around that pull request. Other people who might have thought about the same thing or might have might be working on it elsewhere, um, can chime in and get involved. People that you didn't know were interested in this might, might jump in and say, I'm, I'm interested in um, helping out with this, how about we spike on, on this feature together. Um, there's uh, a process where um, people who've been around at GitHub for a long time who know more of the history of, of things that we've tried before or things that have failed can jump in and say, this is a minefield. You don't really want to get, go down this path. Uh, this, this is a better way to do it. So the pull request becomes the home of, of really fleshing out 
how this feature is going to work, how, how this solving this particular bug in a certain way uh, is, is going to work. And you can comment on the pull request as a whole, or you can go to a, um, a, an individual line and comment on an individual line. Now, as you develop your feature, or your bug fix or whatever, new commits that you commit to your descriptively named branch and push up will get added to that pull request. So we have pull request, description, discussion, commit, 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 discussion, commit, 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 discussion. And eventually, after people have said, hey, this is fantastic, this is ready to ship, usually with a, an emoji or uh, an animated <laughs> GIF of Ron Paul going like this or something, uh, then you know, okay, well, this is good. Let's, let's merge this to master. And the person who does the merging to master is not some gatekeeper, not someone who's reviewing your code and saying that's okay, it's you. The person who opened the pull request is the person who merges the code. You're responsible for your code, so you should be the one who's merging it. So it's really important that the person who does the work is, is taking responsibility for the work that they're doing. And everyone has trust. Everyone is trusted to deploy code. Everyone in the company can deploy code. Because we go through this process where there's this great discussion about how things work um, people are moving towards developing mastery through this discussion of sharing with other people. And um, I work in enterprise support and you know, I merge to github.com relatively regularly. Once things are merged to master, then that deploys automatically. You push a button, master gets merged into your branch, Continuous integration is run again on the merged branch. If everything passes, then that is pushed to production by clicking the button. And all of the, all of the, well, so slightly a lie because, well, you might have already deployed your code. Because one of the things that we do is um, we, yes, we run continuous integration and have tests and everything. But to be really sure that something that we can keep master stable, rule number one, we also do branch deploys. So in our chat room, we can say deploy thumbprint branch to GitHub, and then my thumbprint branch will be running on GitHub, not master. So, but master is still in a stable deployable state. At any time, you know, I'm looking at the exceptions once I've deployed my branch, I'm looking at the, the performance metrics and all the beautiful graphs that we can run directly into our chat channel. Um, and if anything goes wrong, then I can just say deploy GitHub and that will automatically deploy master back up again and get rid of my thumbprint branch. So once I've done that, I can then click merge and everything will deploy automatically, merge to master, and we're gold. We still have a stable branch. So, and as I said, anyone can do that. It's kind of nerve wracking, but. Can you deploy to a subset of users? Uh, we can deploy to a subset of machines. Um, we, I, so, I haven't developed the deployment stuff and the, the ops people would be a better person to ask, but I don't think there's a way to deploy to a subset of users yet. Um, so yeah, everything happens through the chat. Is there like a, uh, you guys have a scheme to deliver the test on support? Yep, so we can also deploy to what we call labs. So you can, you can deploy to a lab, test it out, it's accessible to staff only, um, 
micro-staging environment, which is also done in exactly the same way. So I would say deploy thumbprint to lab one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you find that this works better for you know, because they have this open allocation uh, thing and you obviously embrace like social coding much more than some other teams? Yeah. But yeah. other gatekeepers, I mean, a lot of uh, other organizations, they use a lot of gatekeepers to kind of manage that. So do you see that as something that can be changed without having that whole open allocation structure? Uh, I, I think I think the open allocation structure is is a really powerful way uh, to develop good code. Um, I think that that generally the process can be adapted even if you don't have an al an open allocation structure. Um, I I would argue that um, oh, so many of you are probably working in companies where you're thinking. Okay, well, my manager's never going to let me do that. Uh, but I, I think over time, and GitHub Enterprises is um, doing this as well, over time, development processes are changing slowly. So I think that, that it's recognised that um, you know, a manager saying, you know, you've got to implement this feature is not necessarily the best way to get the best code. So is there any interaction with users before the deployment or any feedback mechanism? Well, as I said, we've got a UX team, so that it's possible that we'll run UX studies before a feature gets implemented, very likely very early in the process rather than towards the end. Um, we can staff deploy code so that all of the GitHub staff have access to features, and that's something that we do very regularly for new user interface things. Um, the other thing is, of course, that, that you might get to a point where you've developed this feature and go, well, actually, after discussing it, this is not shippable, and we shouldn't ship it, we should throw it out. And that's totally cool. Like, being able to, to throw stuff out, because, I mean, why would you deploy stuff that's not that you've found through the development of it isn't what you want. You should be empowered, absolutely empowered, to throw stuff away. Yeah. So, yes, um, things get before users by, they get before staff, and they might get staff shipped, they might get um, branch deployed. So if everyone is allowed to deploy these software branches, uh, wouldn't they override each other by mistake sometimes? No, that's all managed through the deployment process. So uh, if you've deployed a branch then to production, then production is locked and no one else can deploy to it at that time. So we've got a queuing system I can say, let me know when, when I can deploy next. So sometimes there are bottlenecks, like you, know, you, you want to deploy something but, and someone else has a feature branch out so it's locked. Generally, that person is going to be in chat because they've got their feature plant branch deployed. That normally, normal stuff will only be branch deployed for 15 or 20 minutes, and then it will be merged to master. Um, so if you've got an urgent bug fix that needs to go out, then you can say, can I grab production? So. This all sounds you know, you've got happy emoticons and people are speaking to each other very politely. Yes. I can't imagine that it doesn't go the other way. Can, can you kind of comment on kind of when it gets a little bit tetchy and everybody, I mean, because it has to. You know, I'm not saying that the system fails, I'm just saying there has to be time when there's friction in this. Oh, I, 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 the friction actually happens really rarely. Yeah, I'm not saying all the time. I'm just saying once in a while. Well, rare enough, rare enough that I haven't seen it that much to not to, a single time. I've ne no, I've not a single time have I seen in the six months that I've been there have I seen people get upset about mm -hmm. um, about someone saying this feature is wrong or shouldn't be deployed um, because I. We're continually talking about the type of culture that we want. 
um, and things like... Or, or um, for example, could you hurry up so I can deploy my feature? <laughs> yeah, that <doesn't> <laughs> well, yeah, that does happen, and, and generally that's like, okay, yeah, cool, I'll, you know, yeah. I'll hurry up. Yeah. And, and look, you know, if your if your feature needs to go out, then you know I'll just wait till after dinner. <laughs> so yeah, I I mean, I, we're two hundred and thirty odd people at the moment, right? So we, and not everyone's working on the same code bases. So I, I'm generally working on on enterprise things. The the bug fixes and features that I develop are generally things that are only going to even though it's the same code base, they're feature flagged to only go out with enterprise releases. Um, so, you know, my stuff's not that urgent. Someone else is working on GIST, you know, that, that's their stuff. Um, the people, if you're working on some significant thing together, like completely rewriting the way uh, authentication works, then you'll generally have a bunch of people who are working together towards a shared vision. So the, the the things that are more likely to have conflict are, are generally smaller things because the, th the things that are bigger have more people involved in the first place. Mm. Um, and, and I think that that opening of the pull request early gets that discussion out of the way really early before anyone's really invested all that time um, to be offended. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's, that's actually really important, the discussion up front. While we're going questions. On that note, yeah. I mean, so part of this whole, I guess, uh, a lot of control in existing organizations has to do with risk averseness, right? So has anyone broken production? And <laughs> has there been, you know, what, what's the response? But, to that but issue yes, that? of course, of course, production breaks. That's, that, that's, but that happens everywhere. Like, that's, that's not, not anything to do with this workflow. What this workflow does is actually allow us to really quickly Fix. work out that production's broken. We need to do something about that and move forward. Right. So, I mean, what typically happens is when production breaks, then someone says, oh no, how do we prevent this? Right? What caused it? And then typically that's how these controls come in. Yeah, that's so right. And, and that's right. Well, more about what is the, what the, is the response? the way that we view our culture is obviously evolving and the way that we use that technology to support our culture is obviously evolving as well. Technology changes, um, you know, the, the level of the DDoS attacks against GitHub uh, change, um, the, the dynamics of the company change when we've got 230 people as opposed to well, when I joined, it was 180 people, and before that, obviously, we were we were under 40 for a really long time. So, yeah. So, things things will definitely break, but we can respond really quickly. We deploy um, like 40 times a day, and it's mostly seamless. Which I mean, that's and you know, millions of users and. Um, a lot of traffic and um, quite a complex thing to, to integrate Git into, you know, a workflow like that. So, but it stays up. Um, so, talking about my, oh, okay, Sorry. last one and I'll move on. Okay, um, so my question is, so you, you mentioned that you guys like um, um, deploy the branch, right, like and switch between like master and, and feature branches get yep. on, uh, on production. How do you guys manage, like, say, scheme changes? So, like, you know, that happens. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we use Rails migrations. GitHub is a Rails app. Um, we use Rails migrations. Um, kind of nothing I ever touch touches the database, and that's partly about me being able to choose what I work on. <laughs> uh, there's also more complex stuff where. Uh, your code base has to deal with um, with multiple different data sets. Like, like if you're transitioning the way that you um, have you store a large amount of data, and you can't just go well. We never we never take the site down. So all of these all of these deployments are zero downtime 
deployments. So you can't say, okay, we'll migrate this 40 gig of data to another data structure um, and not bring the site down. So you know, there are ways that, and I'll let the people who are more expert in that talk about that when, when they come and visit Singapore. Um, yeah, so migrations. They'll, they'll, I think there'll be people who are talking about that sort of thing quite soon. Uh, so, my team is enterprise, so deployments don't quite work, work like that for enterprise. They don't get in the hands of our users until we do a release. We generally do a, uh, a feature release four times-ish a year in which we bring the github.com code base um, as close as possible. Um, we merge in master into our um, enterprise branch and release that and then release as many patches as possible so that our customers for enterprise demand a little bit more stability and they're a little bit more change averse and they are updating their own code so we can't push directly to, to their installations. So it's a little bit different for enterprise but no, it's significantly different. But the code itself goes out to .com in the same way. It'll eventually get to enterprise. So, um, so what does that have to do with uh, at that culture? People are given the autonomy to decide how they work, where they work, what they want to work on. Open allocation, as someone mentioned. Everyone gets to decide what they're doing. So that autonomy is motivating and leads us to happiness. Um, we work together on those pull requests on features to a mastery of, of the different things that we're doing, which is motivating. We um, build things that are worthwhile, that have a purpose. It's a, a, a good thing to share a vision to say, uh, we're going to build software tools that allow, allow the building of better software tools. Um, and that's how we develop GitHub. Let's see, any more questions? So how often? I'm not sure if I think I'm not actually. How am I going? Okay. Sorry. Uh, so the GitHub that you use in GitHub is how GitHub. Often is how often is that uh, updated? Uh, you know, how often do you deploy that? Uh, or is so that the enterprise version, the one that you No, github.com is developed on github.com. So we have, we have a GitHub <coughs> organization that has a GitHub repository that is the GitHub code. And it gets developed in exactly the, the way that I've described. And we're using the same, the same code that everyone else is using. So you know we're dog fooding the the site itself. Yeah. We we build tools that we want. We make the workflow suit the way that we're building better tools. So we're using it all the time. So what is that for? What is that for you? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, true. I think yeah, you know, we've been pretty good at keeping the site up and under under. Well, the ops team have been pretty good keeping the site up under amazing, amazing circumstances. So, uh, what do you mean by purpose? I mean purpose. So, um, having a shared vision, thinking the, the 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 work that you're doing is worth something. But I mean, the company should have some priorities, a bunch of future that you want. Yeah. So I haven't really talked about um, some of the the bigger vision things, um, I've just sort of said, you know, we build software to help people build software together. Um, but, you know, there are other people who are in a better position to talk about overall strategy and vision. But, but basically, that's what we're thinking about all the time. When I'm deciding what I want to work on, then I'm going to take into account that, that vision that we've developed together. That's what I mean by a sense of purpose. What are some of the challenges 
uh, or the downside of actually this workflow? I mean, some play, some people may not play well, or any other factor. Uh, that's a hard question to answer. I, so generally, I mean, we we're very careful about hiring. Um, it's a, it's a fairly onerous process, uh, in a different way than other companies are onerous, because we focus a lot of our attention on on culture and people who are going to work well together. Um, people who are willing to say, you know, my approach is, is wrong. People who are willing to throw work away. Um, so we don't tend to get those, those clashes of personality. Um, I, I don't see it go wrong that much. A difficult question to answer. <laughs> Winston. <laughs> so you mentioned about you supporting like enterprise um, in hub, right? Yeah. When you talk about support, yeah. um, you know, usually in other companies it will be like an unsexy job. Right? Yep. <laughs> Definitely. So Definitely. How, how does it differ? So um, the support team the support teams at GitHub, the github.com support team and the GitHub Enterprise support team are separate, um, are very much first level uh, on an equal footing with everyone else. There's no, absolutely no concept of you know, you're just support, I'm not really going to listen to you. You can weigh into any discussion, any pull request, uh, and your voice is heard equally. Um, of course, you know, people uh, have expertise in different areas so that they're listened to more and they people are sometimes more natural leaders but those people are in support or they're in development and it, it's all just one team um, yeah so there's no concept of, uh, of underlings as supporting um, like I say I, I can actually decide to leave the support team and go and work on something else if I wanted to. But I actually love working on support. It's a, it's a fantastically interesting job. Uh, and support at, at, at GitHub is, at github.com as well as GitHub Enterprise is really very interesting. So um, yeah, it's a first class team. How is it interesting? Yeah, what's the <laughs> most interesting thing uh, that you have worked on? The most interesting thing that yeah. I've worked on. Uh, well, so GitHub Enterprises is, is, a, is a virtual machine run in someone else's company that I don't have access to. So supporting that is uh, quite a challenge. Um, so it gets, Enterprise gets put in unpredictable network infrastructures with unpredictable things on the network with uh, a variety of different authentication schemes and someone comes to me and says uh, gravitars aren't working or uh, it's no longer sending email or uh, you know no one can log in anymore and talking to them through the process and getting uh, a resolution to that is very challenging and really very interesting for me so that sounds like you have to Right, cool. Potentially know about the rest of the stuff that goes around. So I, I, I have to know about everything to do with github.com and how it works. I have to know about everything that happens with um, GitHub Enterprise, the virtual machine, and, and I'm going to say I, I'm in my team. Um, and I have to be able to get the information that I need about how they've deployed github.com within their organization. I mean, GitHub Enterprise within their organization. Yeah. So it's a, it's a diplomatic role as well, which is interesting too. Is everyone on the team or like only the people from support? Only, so only enterprise people are on pager duty. I'm, I'm not on duty anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have uh, so, uh, uh, a, a couple more winding up things, and there will be more opportunity for questions afterwards. So, if anyone is interested in uh, learning more about the GitHub flow, we have training available. 
um, we can get people to come out and do training or uh, there are free web classes so if you go to training.github.com uh, there are yeah, free things <coughs> to offer as well uh, and I'll get a bunch of references to put up uh, and that's the end and the last thing is that uh, I'll stick around afterwards if you want to have a chat about anything and on Thursday night at Tibbletown in Club Street we'll be having a drink up so if you want to hopefully the stickers will have arrived <laughs> but if they if they haven't arrived then then I'll get them to your next meeting anyway um, but you're welcome to come along and have a chat for as long as you like on Thursday night and a beer on us okay all right can we have a round of applause